Donald Trump delivered another dangerous and bonkers speech, this time in Waco, Texas. Uh, this was his first official 2024 presidential campaign rally. And I attended, as y'all have seen me do in the past, and interview Trump supporters, some wacky stuff to look at on that front later in today's show. If you're watching this on YouTube in segment form, that'll be in a separate segment. So make sure to check it out, check out that video as well. But for now, we're going to walk through Trump's speech. Again, dangerous, bonkers, wacky, dishonest, all the normal characteristics of these Trump speeches. So first, uh, sort of, you know, responding to, he talked a lot about, but I'll just give you a little taste of his response to the possible indictments that we are watching for. Um, he could be charged any day now, coming out of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in regard to the Stormy Daniels hush money payment. But here he tells a story that sums up the entire message coming from the Trump camp, which is Trump is the victim when it comes to these investigations. People can imagine. I had a man come up to me, a very famous man. Almost everybody probably would have heard of him, a businessman. I saw him about two weeks ago. He said to me, could I ask you, I would never even liked him very much, to be honest, but he did say it. He said, could I speak to you for a second? Yeah. Mr. President, I'd like to ask you one question. How do you take it? I said, take what? How do you take the abuse? How do you wake up in the morning and put on your clothing? How do you put on a shirt? Every single day there, if that ever happened to me, I think I wouldn't know what to do. People can imagine. Hmm. So brave. And what is so unfortunate is as I walked around and talked to Trump supporters, they very much believe all of this as you guys are aware and they feel as if trump is this hero standing in between them and a horrible deep state that's coming after them we'll get to later uh, in this segment another clip him saying they're not coming after me they're coming after you and people believe that to their core that somehow trump possibly being held accountable for his wrongdoing is him bravely standing up against this terrible Biden, deep state, Soros controlled federal government that's being weaponized against conservatives. And so all of that rhetoric, as absurd as it sounds to us when we're saying, uh, looks like you committed crimes and you're maybe going to be held accountable for them. Uh, to others, it's, it's gospel. Then his favorite subject here, the cheating that's going on, of course, that's not going on in our elections. So we have to stop them from cheating in elections, because if we don't win this next election, 2024, I truly believe our country is doomed. I think it's doomed. Prosecutorial misconduct is their new tool, and they are willing to use it at levels never seen before in our country. We've had it, but we've never had it like this. We must stop them, and we must not allow them to go through another election where they have yet another tool in their toolkit. So we have to stop them. We talked more extensively about that talking point uh, in a past segment, how he's really setting up and it's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. His followers to be ready and already believe, similar to how he did in the build up to the 2020 election, that the 2024 election in some way was stolen. And now it's not just fraud, dead voters. I'm sure he'll throw that in too if he loses the 2024 election. It's also the prosecutions are stealing the election. These are attempts to steal the election from me, speaking as a voter Trump. Um, and people are believing that too. And so if he loses in 2024, or even just as we approach 2024, if the prosecutions continue to move forward, his followers will see that as a sign that as Trump said, America's doomed. And we know what happens even with a specific example of MAGA when individuals think the country's doomed. Um, and we've seen how that plays out if something happens in this case, if the 2024 election is stolen from Trump, which if he loses, it's not going to be because it was stolen. It's going to be because people don't like rhetoric like that. <laughs> That's why. Um, and then a little bit more on election related stuff. The Supreme Court 
didn't have the courage to right the wrong of the 2020 election. They knew what was going on. Tax returns were always considered sacred. Lawyers, in their own way, if you can believe this, were considered sacred. Today, lawyers go before grand juries all over this place if they happen to be lawyers representing Republicans, and they treat lawyers like they're criminals. It used to be if you had a lawyer, the lawyer was somebody that was very much considered from the standpoint of what we're talking about above reproach. Now they get thrown in with everybody else. A couple things there. Him saying the Supreme Court didn't have the courage to right a wrong. All he means is they didn't have the courage um, or his anti-democratic nature to overthrow a free and fair election. It's good that they didn't um, with all the Supreme Court's flaws. And then his point about lawyers and uh, his confusion as to why, and this does kind of get to the core of what we've been talking about in regard to the uh, prosecutions into uh, again possible prosecution i say into him um, or against him and what i've talked about is actually this is an example if he is indeed held accountable legally of our justice system not exhibiting the flaws we've seen it and will continue to see it exhibit uh far too often which is wealthy well-connected powerful individuals often are able to not be held accountable as they should because they can hire the best lawyers they have enough resources and so trump there it seems to be is confused because he's thinking normally whenever i've been in legal trouble i've been able to pay good lawyers and they got me out of it and all was well and that might not work in this situation and it seems to be a little bit of what he was touching on there and then random tangent here I didn't know what subpoena meant. Now I'm one of the kings. I know exactly. I can look at the color. I can tell you where that one came from. Well, that's a nice. Now, if I didn't do all that stuff, or if I was doing badly in the polls, instead of the numbers we are at 69 and 59 to a very small number, uh, it would, you know, well, they wouldn't be going after me. When they go after me, they're going after you. I, if I didn't know. And that was the talking point I referenced earlier. They're not going after me. They're going after you. By the way, how did you not know what subpoena meant before all these investigations? Um, but no, they're not going after his followers. The followers think that uh, some force is coming after them and Trump's standing in the way somehow. But as long as you, as a MAGA <laughs> supporter, as if I were talking to them right now, um, haven't committed crimes, you're good. You're good. Trump's only being gone after because he has possibly committed crimes, which is what we want to happen if people commit crimes, right? Law and order party? Republicans? Eh? Uh, and then he brags once again about his mental competency, competency test. I said, should I do it or not? And I did it. And you know what? I aced it. Got them all right. Every single thing. Some of them are tough. And, you know, it was after that, it was after that that nobody called me stupid anymore. It was very good. Because I never liked that narrative. I don't like the word stupid, but other people are very stupid. <laughs> he said, I don't like the word stupid, but other people are stupid. All right, there we go. And, of course, he's bragging about the dementia screener, if I'm not mistaken, that he took with the animals and stuff on it that he had to name highly highly intelligent guy um and then just mocking irony with this one the whole place the whole place was laughing they're laughing in our country we don't want anyone to laugh nobody laughed at our country when i ran it i can tell you that whole place. even his followers know one of the defining characteristics before his whole you know trying to overthrow democracy thing before that one of the defining characteristics of his presidency was how laughed at he was as a president how unserious he was as a president and then we get to the desantis bashing or the anti-desantis stuff but i'm a loyalist and and when a man comes to me tears in his eyes he's at almost nothing in the polls 
And he's fighting somebody that's at 42, and he's got almost $30 million in the bank. He's at almost nothing. He's got no cash. And I say, I can't give you an endorsement. There's no way you can win. You're dead. But he fought a little bit, like 150. He was certainly no Jim Jordan, that I can tell you. He fought a little bit, just a little bit, on impeachment hoax number one, impeachment hoax number two, meaning on television, because I didn't know him very well. But I saw him, so he came and he really wanted. I said, you can't win, can you? How do you can win? Sir, if you endorse me, I'll win. Please. Please, sir, endorse me. And I said, all right, let's give it a shot, because honestly, the Secretary of Agriculture, Adam pa Okay, then he continued with the story to say that DeSantis was able to win. And while obviously most of what leaves Trump's mouth are lies, in this situation, even though, no, I don't think DeSantis was at the feet of Trump crying, it is fair to say DeSantis built his political career, at least his run for governor, um, around being super pro-Trump, around being a Trump guy. And his campaign ad showed that very nicely that we've gone over multiple times where he's teaching his kid to be pro-Trump. But when Trump talks about this, he shows very clearly the way that he approaches politics, which is when he's thinking about endorsing someone, he goes, will they be loyal to me? And that's what offends him so much now that he endorsed DeSantis and DeSantis has not been loyal to him, at least possibly running for president against Trump. And that reveals that for Trump, it's not about endorsing the person he thinks would be best for the job or would serve the constituents the best, has the best policy positions. It's just, I want them to be loyal to me. That's what this endorsement's for. And I saw him on TV defending me, so that was good. <laughs> I mean, that is just very representative of Trump's approach to politics for sure. And then a little bit more here on DeSantis. But when you're getting a guy so he gets the nomination because of you, he wins the election because of you, two years later, the fake news is up there saying, will you run against the president? Will you run? And he says, I have no comment. I say, that's not supposed to happen. I have no comment. No. So I'm not, I'm not a big fan, but I love, I love, that's right, he's a disciple of Paul Ryan. He is actually a disciple. That's why he wanted to cut Social Security and Medicare. It is interesting that his followers, while they'll be real engaged at certain parts, during the DeSantis segment, at least what we just saw there, they weren't very energetic, weren't very vocal, responding to his jokes and stuff. Uh, then we move to a little bit on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the meeting between Putin and Xi Jinping. And before I even arrive at the Oval Office, shortly after I win the presidency, I will have the disastrous war between Russia and Ukraine settled. It would never have happened. I used to talk to Putin. I got along well with Putin. I used to talk to Putin about it. It's something he certainly had in his mind. Never even talked about it. For four years, you didn't even hear about it. What? He said Putin talked about it with Trump. It was on his mind. Putin never talked about it. <laughs> okay. And to his, or his first point, as we've said many times now, provides zero specifics as to how he would have prevented this or how he would end it in 24 hours which is what he usually says here. He just said he would end it before he even became president. As soon as I was out or left or however you want to describe that catastrophe. Losing an election. They started putting soldiers on the border. But even then, he didn't want to do it. He wanted to get a piece. Now it looks like he'll end up probably getting the whole thing. But I've never seen anything like it. What's happened? And if you saw the other day with President Xi, smart, top of his game. President Putin, smart, very smart people standing there talking about the world order for the next 100 years. That's one of the saddest things you can imagine. One of the saddest. So before we discuss further, it is just strange how, even though, of course, you can recognize someone as terrible and also understand them to be intelligent. And we've had those conversations before. This person is very dangerous and smart, and that makes them more dangerous. But it is weird that 
it seems every time Putin comes up, Trump insists on uh, talking about how smart he is. It's just a strange trend there. Um, but more importantly, as I've said before, it is really easy to point at, to recognize problems. The hard part is putting forward solutions to those problems. And so within the MAGA crew right now, you have a lot of people criticizing the actions of the Biden administration. And a lot of their criticism is centered around the very real problems that the administration is responding to, meaning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And one of the things he just mentioned there was it's concerning to see the unity between Putin and Xi Jinping within the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What's going on there? Um, but then you have to explain as someone who's critical of Biden in the way he is very uh, in a significant way, supporting Ukraine and leading uh, the United States government in supporting Ukraine significantly, you have to explain why what you would do would be better, why your stance, your approach to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how the United States should support Ukraine um, in this situation would yield better outcomes because individuals like Tucker Carlson, Marjorie Green, and even Trump constantly pretend they are on the side of peace, but then it seems the only solution being put forward by those same individuals is the Biden administration is being too supportive of Ukraine and is driving the war in some way, when in reality, what's driving the war is Russia's invasion of Ukraine, <laughs> is Russia invading Ukraine. Um, and so if we were to stop supporting Ukraine, how does that make peace more likely? That makes Russia feel emboldened and cause way more devastation to be likely more likely in ukraine um, without the support of the united states when it comes to the aid that we're sending military lethal and otherwise and so it really is enraging because so many people are buying into this narrative that it's the united states driving this allowing this to go on when in reality all we should do right now is support ukraine so that they can stand as strong as possible because the only way this is coming to an end is russia stops and they're more likely to stop if they aren't able to be successful in this invasion. Um, and then last moment we'll look at from his speech, doubling down on the I am your retribution line. I am your warrior. I am your justice. And I took a lot of heat for this one, but I only mean it in the proper way. For those who have been wronged and betrayed, of which there are many people out there that have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. We will take care of it. We will take care of it. So I do think if Trump, God forbid, is able to, excuse me, get back into the White House, it will be a presidency of retribution, revenge. He will be going down that list and trying to uh, get back at every person who wasn't perfectly loyal, who wronged him in some way, who didn't go along with his election lies. And that's a terrifying prospect. Make sure you are subscribed to the YouTube channel.